But we're glad to be open. We were closed for 20 days uh, during COVID. And I'll tell you, it's a lot harder to be closed than just to be open. Mm. Uh, it just didn't feel right. It was nice for about 72 hours. I'm not gonna lie to you. About 72 hours, I wasn't directing traffic. Or, but then after that, it kind of just didn't feel right. It feels weird. So um, anyway, great staff, visitors have been great, great support from the top to the bottom on everything we needed. And there were some challenges with that early on. But uh, I need to make this side note or really highlight this. Everything I talk about tonight is a whole bunch of people. I mean, more people than I could. I started to make a list and I quit. Uh, when I do these, it's everybody from the folks that rallied early on to save Radner, Dr. Farrell, Farrell Gates, some of y'all in this room here that worked hard, and some of the other people that were involved after Radner kind of got going. Um, Friends of Radner Lake was a critical part of that, but there were other groups. Matt Pritchard, my friend Matt Pritchard and others uh, were in there. Dennis Gibson, we lost Dennis a couple years ago. Um, so a whole lot of people, um, and everybody's got their everybody's got their favorite high points. So I'm not skipping over anything intentional tonight. Um, what I told uh, Jack when I was setting this up, I was going to try to highlight, kind of hit some things that we really focused on. That maybe not everybody knows about. We've got the history cases. Uh, John Brochauer and others did these cases uh, around 1992, the early 90s, when the visitor center was built. This building was opened in uh, 1992, the Walter Crowley Visitor Center. But we'll talk about some of that as we go through. I've got 100 slides and I talk fast. Uh, so thankfully I talk fast. Both my parents are deaf. So sign language is my first language. They have been with my parents, very kind to them. Um, but I talk fast, I read things. If you're not listening to me, I'm gonna know it. I'm just telling you, I can read the body language a mile away. It's like a sixth sense. So it just comes with turf. Um, so, uh, anyway, it's a, so being a, a child of deaf adult is a blessing. It is, mm -hmm. it gives me an insight. I wish I could tell you, explain it to you, and I can't. Uh, where that really plays into is our interpretation. You read children's principles of interpretation. That's a big part of what we're trying to do on the ground with visitors. Uh, what we don't like doing is the enforcement part. That just comes with our life. We're up, we were up 400,000 visitors just in the year of COVID. Wow. We broke 2.2 million. Wow. That's more than the zoo. And that's not something that we wanted to do. We were glad, though, that we could be there. It, was, it seemed like it was us and Publix that were open. That's about it. So we're glad it's not at that stage. But we're tapering down now. We're down about 10,000 a month from last year. So it's coming back down to more where we like it, more manageable. Um, but it's a challenge. This month we'll do 280,000 people. So do about 127 parking spaces. So do that math. <laughs> it doesn't add up, but it adds up. So anyway, I'll get going because I'm going to keep you all right. But uh, right away, a couple of high points. This is the Larkspur. I love this slide. That's what you're seeing. For those of you went on the hike mm -hmm. this afternoon saw that. Mm -hmm. It's always been here. We took out, we had a AmeriCorps team work on our ranger staff around 2004. And we took out 50 acres around Ganyer Ridge to the lake trail. There was stump cut, bulling and all that. And then it exploded the following year. And ever since it has expanded. And it was just pure, it was one of our best examples of get rid of the bad stuff, the good stuff's there, you gotta let it breathe. And let it find its place. Um, so these views y'all seen, birding is what Radford is known for. One of the best burning sites in the southeast, in my opinion. We're definitely one of the best warmer spots in the country, and I don't think that's fact. But uh, some of the things we're really highlighting now, Big Tree Award, we won two of those last uh, couple months ago at the National Tree Foundation. They got a great program there. We've had several over the years. But we're trying to do that as a designation of some of the properties we're getting to highlight the value of getting these properties. Um, this is going to be coming up. This is a little plant called Whitewater Crowfoot. I didn't find it. It was found, but we registered it after our property manager. And this is something you'll see rangers with spotting scopes on the road starting in May. And it's about that big. And we put spotting scopes on it wow. and let you view it through our eye. Um, but it's found in about four to six counties in Tennessee. It's a glacier remnant. Doesn't belong here, but it's here. What's the name of it again? Uh, Whitewater Crowfoot. So this is duckweed here on the bottom. That's not the plant. 
a little white flower comes up and it grows on a horseshoe in the back of the lagoon. It's a bog plant. It, needs, it need, doesn't need a lot of current. So it likes those boggy areas. And then we've had some other great stuff from our research. Friends of Red Lake's done a lot of research. This is from Penn State University. That's a plant that we have found. I found it in 2002 and I didn't know what it was and I gave up on it. Mm -hmm. Roger McCoy, my friend, the director of natural areas, is out here doing a wildfire pack test. He sends me an email that night, hey, by the way, did you know you got this growing along the road? Thanks, Roger. So he did research on it for about three years, and we discovered by default that um, we found out why it's not, it's in nature for what it is. It gets about eight foot tall, but when it matures, it tastes like ice cream and beer. Wow. So one night, I'm out, we got these plants, I got four of them. I get excited, I sent an email up to all the bosses. <laughs> Friends Cruise <laughs> up to Penn State. It's going to bloom in the morning. It's opening up. It's going to be awesome. Tomorrow's going to be a great day. I went in at 10 o'clock that night for the night shift. Came back on at 5 a.m. and they had somebody to run a weed eater up and down each one of the plants. No. It was the deer. It wasn't oh, anybody. Okay. It was the deer. That's what it looked like. <laughs> so the next year, you can see there's some wire. We put wire cages around these plants. They, they like certain areas. They really need a balance of moisture and sunlight. And ironically, the areas that they trim the trees along the road is its favorite environment. Mm. And the other favorite environment is when a beaver cuts down a tree, it exposes the, the new sunlight. Mm -hmm. So the observation deck of the spotting scopes, that's where the second one was documented. This is my picture, uh, Roger Schmidt of this, the UT Herbarium with Dr. Wolford, and it was the first occurrence in Davidson County's history. So I think that was 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got some unique plants that we've studied and we're trying to protect and condition every time. Um, this is Terry's Lurger Slide. Uh, 2.2 million uh, visitors last year. That's coming back now. Uh, we, since 2015, we're up about 700,000 visitors. Vanderbilt study shows 90 people a day still come to Middle Tennessee. <laughs> you see turkeys, not these kind of turkeys, but other kind of turkeys on the trail. <laughs> the things that they made. <laughs> um, we just recently moved this bridge, and if you're wondering why, it's from our research with Penn State. We moved it and built 350,000 yards of bridges, thanks to Friends of Red and Lake and some donors. And we're making the trail go around with the prediction that this would flood and become a wetland from our beaver research with Penn State that we published on about five years ago. I said it would be no more than five years, it was five months. They're flooding wow. it right now. We got wood ducks next thing. I found a wood duck next two days ago up there. Um, it's already converted up. So the research was right. The research is this our trail system, the human scent of the trail system, is the defining barrier of the beaver's range. 90 plus percent of the cuttings from the lake trail to the lake, less than 10% were on the across the trail. So we use that in the strategy. We built the trail system by national trail standard and uh, we moved this and made it go around. And then you'll still see the post there. We're using those as a research transect for cameras. You know, camera, we got a camera system in there now set up to plan with. And then we post those online and make people see. But Do you uh, mean that, that you knew that the beavers were going to build a dam there so that you put the bridge there so that the water would be? No. Yeah. I knew if we took that bridge out, there's no more human scent. The beavers would be. Sorry. Thank you. No, they did. So that makes sense? So we knew we took out us, we take us out of the equation, and we go around, the beavers would start damming it up and flooding. Well, that uh, those trees that are there now will go away and something else come up. Once it comes they're gonna they're gonna gurgle and cut everything in there. And then that same plant that you saw in the cages, there's hundreds of those in there. Wow. And we get these new pockets. So when they gurgle the tree, you get the new sunlight. We're gonna start seeing we're gonna see that population of plants expand. By, by letting nature do its thing. And what are those plants called? I'm sorry. What are those plants called? Donning rattlesnake leaf. And is, it, is there any danger that the trees will fall on the bridge when the beavers chew them down? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <clears throat> That's when the bald headed guy with the chainsaw is. <laughs> Do some work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good work. <laughs> so, this is what we look like in a map world today for the public. Um, this is what the current visitor sees. Uh, this map's actually luckily outdated. We've added several acres since then. I'll show you some of that. Oh. Talk about a few things. Otters came in around 98. 
They were released in the Harvard River as a restocking program by Tennessee Wildlife. They did a great job with that. They eventually moved up Otter Creek. It's about 4.4 miles away. They moved up from the Harpen, and they found their home here on our 85 acre lake. When we closed the road in 2002, thanks to Ron Turner, our councilman, who was his last three council readings, he had the road abandoned by Metro. And then during the Bredesen administration, the start of the Bredesen administration, he got the road accepted by Metro. And it was a game changer. And some of you, y'all remember, if y'all don't y'all worked here then. It seemed like overnight, it was about six months. We started seeing beavers. I was actually looking at relocating beavers here. We had the trapping program we were going to do in West Tennessee and bring them in. They were just close to us. Just close to us. That's all I had to do. So, um, y'all, most of y'all know the story. That's the picture in there. That's Max t shirt, by the way, in the case that we're going to put the State Library in Archives. <laughs> So we're working on that process, but um, we're coming up on our 50th anniversary. We'll have that in about 18 months, next two years. So some exciting stuff coming with that. Hopefully COVID is a memory by then, and we can have some fun events and do some neat stuff <coughs> with partners like Sierra Club and TOS and everybody. Um, this was the plan. It's in that case right over there. About 200 plus homes, drain the, drain the lake about 20 feet. Um, that was the plan. And we need more mansions. I know everybody believes that. The rule about the rule about building around right there like this, everybody's against it after they build their house. <laughs> it's just human nature. It's not good, bad, or indifferent. But this is my favorite thing from that drive. I was three years old then. And that's in one of these cases. Three. I was three. Damn. <laughs> Fifty one today. But I, this is my favorite quote that really epitomizes. Not just Radnor, a lot of our state parks and state natural areas, a lot of places that may have, you may have a sense of place that are special to you. It wasn't government. Government was involved, but government had to be routed and prodded a little bit and worked with and all those things. And then this started. Friends around the lake was formed. They're my right arm. They bring sanity at times when there's none in, in government. Uh, no matter how many great people we got in government, at times things just seem archaic the way they operate. They allow us to work in real time on things like buying property and things like that. If you got the license plate, thank you. We make about fifty or sixty thousand a year from that. Um, now I'm going to take you back. We're going to skip around a little bit. We're going to go pre seventy three. So I'm three years old this time. Um, so we're up and say we're the first state natural area. Uh, a couple people tell you we're not. A couple people say we're the first eight. There were eight done in just a very short period. I still like to say we're number one. They were the most visited in natural areas, so I'll take that. <laughs> but uh, we were in the first eight or so that were done. They were done right in a tight uh, window. But the wood duck is our logo because it, it was our only resident waterfowl year round. They chose that. If you bought one of the um, pieces that were done in the early 70s, it's part of the fundraising. Thank you. But uh, it's now, it's still our logo today. And it'll be our 50th anniversary. But the railroad is why the lake was built. It was a reservoir for the l &M, which is now CSX. But it was the industry of national. So here's kind of a breakdown. Um, it also became the sportsman club for the railroad employees. We've actually done oral history interviews with some of those folks, thankfully, before they moved on. So we have that, that information on tape and transcribed, and it is priceless. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were some other things that went on. They put everything. We became a state wildlife observation area. Um, Bob Patrick did that in the 80s. There was about 28 state wildlife observation areas. Right there was like one of those first 28. So there's a couple of distinctions that we've got. Um, and then Al Gaynor, big part of our history. There's a lot of that in the case over there. Um, but instrumental, really recognizing Radnor for the wildlife view. From day one. And there's a whole other story there now. That's about three hours. But the Gainer family, we actually had the son on tape before he passed away. And he gave us one critical piece of information I'll tell you about in a few slides. But uh, the Mac House is what we call it. The Baker Mac House is what it is officially called. And that's the caretaker house on the lake. It was the visitor center until 1992. Mrs. Mac, I was fortunate to meet her. We gave her an award in my first or second year around 2002, 2003. She was tough as a corn cob. 
We had an oral history interview with her. Somebody had released a gator on the lake, a crocodile. It was a pet. Somebody had it. They released it in the lake. And we got on tape. She says, you know, I got tired of hearing about that. I went out there, put my pistol on my robe, and I shot it. And I pinned it up on the boat on the dock, boat dock wall. I was tired of talking about the gator. <laughs> so, great lady. great A lot of great stories there. Um, but she was really kind of the first person in our world. She was the conservationist. She was the protector of the lake for many years. So, um, great story there. Um, anyway, great person. Uh, but here's the water route to the rail yards. It's about three miles, and there's still some of it intact in small pieces. Um, what we did around, we did this over a couple of years, but the valve house, if you've not been to it now, that, that was the thing. The valve house has always been there. Um, it collapsed around the 2010 flood. We knew about it. We were trying to think what we wanted to do with it. We wanted to do something. We were getting assessments on its historical significance, if we could salvage it, all these things. Uh, Randy Hedgepath actually was the first person that brought that to my attention when I got here in 2001. He had an idea. And we worked on it some, and then uh, he, he moved on to do the state nationalist role. Um, but basically what you got is the dam, and this is really one of the best birding areas in the state. It was an industrial complex. It was the valve, the dam, okay, itself, the spillway. That was a complex for the railroad with the lake. So nothing natural about it. So... A lot of people think, well, Radio is this pristine natural area, undisturbed. They did everything in the world to get that. And I think the success story of it, other than the people involved, is if you leave it alone and let nature do its thing, look what it produces. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the story of Radio, in addition to the people that helped save it. So, uh, the entire, so this is the wild house at that time. It's fallen in, uh, it's covered in bush honeysuckle and privet. So we registered these sites uh, with our historic studies. I'll talk more about that. And then we said, hey, we want to make this a, a historical trail in the natural area. We couldn't find another one in the state. So we want to do that here. Focus on one key thing in the history of right now. So um, that up top is the valve, which is ginormous. Um, I don't even want to think about how they got it in in 19, whatever. Um, the valve house itself had been redone. It's got shingles on it here in this photo. Shingles wouldn't come in until around the 1940s or 40s or so. Um, so it had shaped shingles or tin on it before that, more than likely, from our studies. And this was an assessment in 2007. Um, we got from uh, Brian Beagles. He was the uh, historic commission. It's worth saving. I don't know if you can say it. It's, it's getting pretty far to carry it. Three years after this, it collapsed. So what we did is let's say let's salvage what wood we can, let's get it back to exactly how it's supposed to be, and, and let's start down that road. So this pipe came from a development that was going out of here, right here. This is the Moorhead track. We all know you remember that one right out here on the, the Granny White Trace, the next street over. I was driving down the road. I've been here for you know, eight, ten years ago. So I'm driving down the road, and I noticed they're excavating, and there's a clump of trees, and there's See that part right there sticking up? And I'm like, that's part of the bridge of the pipe. So the developer was not, does not send me Christmas cards <laughs> <laughs> because of my role at the time or now. So John Proshower actually approached them and they let us, let us salvage that. We, we rented a backhoe, we got it, and now it's on the trail. And that was a, that was a relief valve that went down into the main line that went over around your yard. So if you got a chance, and then here's Dr. Hexton, <laughs> um, showing on his best side, but that's his work ethic, and that's why I love him. We'll talk more about him. This is a student from MTSU at the time, and that's where the valve house was, and it collapsed, and we're working at the base, which is pretty complex, actually, given that was done in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So there's the valve. The building's gone at this point. We took all the material out, and we did all the semester classes. And it's that same king with natural areas now. He's a ranger. He did a great job with us. Um, so we had to clean out the actual pipe under there to let the water drain out from the valve. 
And then the porch company in Nashville donated their time. They brought out 20 something employees. Friends ran it like bought the lumber. The turf managers actually made a donation of $4,000 for the lumber. We had it milled in Telco Plains out of repurposed utility poles. That's our theme lumber. And they treat it to spec. And then they came out and they put up, you can Google, you can YouTube this. There's a Grand Lake Bauhaus uh, porch company. And they did a uh, GoPro. And they did, you can fast track the whole thing and see them put it all together. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. so this is their staff. They were great. They were great to do that. And then this is what you see today. It's a picture by Ranger Paul right after that. But um, we published on this. This is a poster done by Dr. Griffin and Ranger Sam King about the process of the Valhouse House Trail. Um, and then this is the students after we got everything done. But this is kind of the summary. I'm not going to read to you. Uh, don't worry, I won't. But um, the Valhouse House Trail was really a, kind of a case study for us on what we can do to interpret to the public the history of Red which actually goes back to the early 18, to the mid 1800s now. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But um, it was a tangible example for interpretation. And it's now got a registered archaeological site to it. So, um, Dr. Griffin is now at Henderson State University in Arkansas, and they were just here last month doing research on a new piece of property I'll talk about. So, we're still doing that research. Here's Dr. Yates, um, Mr. Thompson. Great people that spent time with us. They come out, spend a couple hours of time with us, and their words now are transcribed and part of our history. I'm so thankful they took the time to do that. So, um, if you didn't realize it, when you're hiking out here, <clears throat> there are archaeological sites all over the place. Most of them are farmsteads, most of them are around the early 1900s. <clears throat> and they look like this. We get what our, they register as an archaeological site. This is a brick building below Ganyu Ridge. Mm -hmm. It's a dynamite shed for the dam and the mm -hmm. lake being built. There's a couple ways to know that. We didn't have anything on, it, on record that they used dynamite. We knew they did. Mr. Ganyu, three months before he passed away, in his oral history interview, he said, I remember daddy blowing up stumps. Dynamite in a shed back there. <laughs> That's it. There's one just like this, about a foot differential in size at, at uh, Copper Town. Same. Dr. Hector does a great presentation on that one. But we found things like tin and nails and other things like that that were used as part of that. That's what this layout looks like. See the yellow flags? Those are pieces of metal. Mm -hmm. So you can start figuring out the way things line, and they'll line up. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how it is. This is what it looks like though, all this work we've been doing for 20 years. These are all archaeological sites registered in the National Record. And they all follow the Appalachian settlement pattern upstream, up the holler. Mm -hmm. Okay, up the holler, on the flats. This is what it looks like to the visitor. This is our East parking lot, Turkey Panel. These are some of the families involved in graphics history. The Leonard homestead that we're out there now on the east side by the east park. That house was torn down and my state house was built right behind it in the uh, mid 1970s. So, and this was the Machi farmstead is actually the hall farm, what we most of us know as the hall farm now. Some of us went on a hike. Some of us went on a hike there last spring. But this is another, this is a 2D angle of the sites. The visitor center being the far background. We're looking to the west. East to west. So you see how that settlement pattern comes up all the draws. Here's another map view of it. So, what's ahead? So, that's a little bit of the history. Talk about what I love this slide. This is what we started with. Great. That saved the lake. That's not that. That's not that. This is where we're at today. Plus one or two more parcels that aren't over yet. Um, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. And it's not square, it's not perfectly round, because the ecosystem is not square or perfectly round. So we did that on a couple of priorities, really about four priorities. Watershed, viewshed are the top two, they always have been. Um, 
That's her property. She would only be protected to the highest level. You can also have conservation easements. We've done that with our friends at the land trust on some properties. Um, if they don't run me out of here in the next 20 years, we're going to get about 100 to 200 more acres. Okay. It's going for about 200 to 300,000 an acre right now. Wow. That's the average land value. Unless we have a great landowner that works with us and gives us a break, which happens a lot. KG, KG on cheap, sold us 75 acres for about 13,000 acres. Well, my first year here, over six year period. That's legacy. People ask about legacy. That's it. It's all these blocks up top, that big circle up top, that's their property. And the only thing in the center is their house. They put a, they paid to put a conservation easement on it in 2015. So that's the kind of relationship and great landowners we've got that's worked with us. Uh, Harris Ridge Trail Project. This is kind of history. Um, if you like Gandy Ridge, it's Gandy Ridge times two to three. Uh, worked on it about 16 years, 15 years before we got it under contract. And we bought it in three phases. But it is a trail, we call it the Gateway Trail, from Franklin Road all the way to Radnor Lake. It's three miles one way. You do that, go around the lake and back to your car, it'll be an eight mile hike. And you don't have to wait in line. You don't have to wait in line for to get in. We build a hundred car parking area off the regular road. Mm -hmm. With ten to twenty percent of it's going to be EV parking. We're going to leave the state yeah. in EV wow. parking. Maybe the south. So, uh, we have the highest EV use. Thanks to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. neighbors. We have the highest EV use here in any of our parks, any state parks. We made up about sixty to seventy percent of EV use in state parks last year. <laughs> that's just that's y'all. So thank y'all. I've already requested six more. They rolled their eyes at me, but I think I think it's coming because it's coming. We all know it's coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we want to be ahead of it. We don't want to react. We want to be proactive. So that's our planning. But these red parcels with the Harris Ridge project, we call it the Harris Ridge Trail project. The red parcels were bought over a couple of years, different phases, but we own all that now. Here's a little closer up view. So the blue line in the middle is our watershed line. Um, but parking area would be right there at Franklin Road. We do not want more parking on Otter Creek. And I know that sounds crazy to some people. But Otter Creek was not designed for two things to be. It just wasn't. We can't argue to close the road in 2002 and then want to triple the amount of cars on it. So there's a balance there. Um, no one, you know, it's hard to predict you're going to have this kind of visitation with the utilities and things that run on this road. So we don't want to put a five car, five story parking garage here in the parking lot. Um, we have some other plans that we can't discuss, but this is what, this is what, this is now and the future. We've got to connect. We've got to be smart. So that, that, those wheels are moving. We have a lot of support to do that. Um, so, yeah. Um, when you go back, the boundary for the watershed, does that mean like that's the parking and everything that we found? That's the top, thank you. So the watershed, our watershed is defined depending on who you talk to. So our water definition is if you can technically roll from the top of the ridge into the bowl, rather than in the bowl, if you could roll in, if it kept rolling rather than saturate, and made it to the lake, it's our watershed line. Our viewshed line is halfway down the ridge behind it. And we do that at a three-story house um, or a cell tower. Okay, so that's what View Shed uh, is to us, and that is our current trails, our current facilities, and also our future plan trails that we've been up. Uh, we're transparent about all that, um, all that we can be. So, does that answer your question? So, um, here's where this started, though. When we kind of backed into this a little bit. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a 1932 map that my friend James Russ found for me and Dr. Hampton. Me and James were students at Dr. Hampton's in MTSU in 1992. And uh, James is a lot smarter than me, his GIS whiz. But right here, this is this line is the Nashville Interurban, Nashville and Franklin Interurban Railroad. Some of y'all have been on hikes with me there. Um, you got to remember this. This is 1932. When was I 65 then? <laughs> 60s, get into there. 
So they moved parts of Franklin Road. They blasted and cut and it all went. So we knew this went through the property we were trying to buy. We discussed that with the Harris family. They were great to work with. Um, but we were wondering, we knew we had a roadbed through the property. We didn't know what kind of roadbed. We thought it could be a spur of the L and N. It could have been part of Franklin Road, you know. But it started lining up. So we go to closing on that property. And that's what the yellow, or what we saw on that, we call Harris 3. That's the last phase. That's uh, Ray and Peggy Harris in the middle. The Neelys. Uh, Ray and Gail are brother and sister. Ray passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. But this is what it looks like from the interstate. This is actually from the overpass by Waffle House in Brooklyn. And I can tell you where every Waffle House is in Tennessee. <laughs> but, um, so Harris one we bought in 2010, 37 acres, raised a million dollars. We gave you that, thank you. We got a $500,000 grant thing from the L um, Land Water Conservation Fund, thanks to our buddy Jim Cooper, and Governor Bredesen at the time, to help make that happen so we could match it. We had a six year contract, we closed on it in nine months. So we went on to phase two. Got phase two, 2015. Phase through a couple years later. So on the property, you start finding things like this. That's a 17-foot hole in the ground. System. Limestone line, beautiful. Mm -hmm. The craftsmanship that went into that, I cannot get my head around. I get frustrated putting together my remote on my TV. <laughs> this is a limestone well that goes down. You use limestone for water clarity, okay? That's the high-end wells or systems. You use that limestone. So to do that, you got to dig that out three times. It's just like doing a retainer, retainer wall in your driveway or something. You got to dig it out way back, build it, and then backfill it. Well, what they did then. So this was covered in bush honeysuckle, and as I'm cutting a path to Lee Heights on the property, as we're trying to raise money for it, I almost fell off in that. <laughs> I had a machete, it was July, Ranger Paul was with me, and I'm cutting bush honeysuckle, and I would like to tell y'all, it's a very specific craft, it's, it's two people in the woods where as far as I can see each other cutting and going together, but the only I can see is that, that stone is the only thing visible at the time, so luckily I was like, what's this, and it's 70 foot down the bottom, been down in there, and it's neat, but so this is the historical farming. We've been doing research on it ever since. And we just found our earliest artifact known on our property right here in this area. And it's gonna be around the mid 1800s. So uh, work's still going on there. If you go on the hikes, this is what we want. <clears throat> we want to provoke your thought. We want you to want to come back. We want you to think about that place. One more of it. So if you, hopefully you want to go on one of our hikes. We have those in the spring and fall typically. Um, just had one there, two of those last month. Got a Harris Ridge hike coming up, Harris one in about a week. Me and Ranger Wheeler are doing that. So you can sign up for those online, they're free. Um, but this is the Urban Rail. It was a homeless camp. Had four homeless encampments. Had meth, meth products and stuff on the ground there. A lot of stuff. The students cleaned up. We hauled eight truckloads of trash out of this cup. Um, it took about two weekends to clean it up. And then here's Greer Tipple, we're friends with that lake, and Dr. Efton, there's Sam King in the back. So Dr. Efton said, we've got to find two things, Steve. We've got the map. So we've got this historical map. We've got to find barbed wire on each side of the inner urban rail, because they had livestock. The records talk about livestock blocking the rail almost on a weekly occurrence. Mm -hmm. So we've got to find barbed wire on each side. Two, we've got to find at least one spike. We found over 150 spikes. Wow. So we found a lot. So this is them holding some railroad spikes in their hand. I was on cloud nine. That was like Cinco de Mayo because <laughs> we just wanted more. We were just like, man, we just found more. So uh, these are the students working on the rail bed. And if you go on a hike, this is what it looks like now. Uh, this is a hiking group we did on Saturday morning. And these are the students that come back every spring now. They were just here in March. These are the Henderson State University students. They're helping us build trail. They're helping us design the trail. Uh, if you've built trail before, or worked on trail projects, those are done by control. We do everything by national trail standards. 
So you find a control point. The control point could be if you had a Native American burial mound, what's a control point that we want to build a trail away from? You got an endangered plant population. That's one we may want to highlight, but certainly we don't want to take the trail through. And then if you got a big tree that everybody wants to hug and love on and enjoy, you take the trail right to it. We want you to experience that, smell it, feel it, have that sense of place. So um, <clears throat> this is the trail that's being built. It is in the slow and methodical process because we want to do it right. It involves us removing all the exotic plants on the property before we open the trail. All of them. That's how you build a trail. We're not going to have trails through tunnels and honey It's just not how we do it. Yeah, so this is what the ridges look like. Here's what you, unique about the first ridge top. It's on a different cutting than the entire area. It's the largest chestnut oak of any ridge in this area. So um, I can't tell you why. I don't know the reason why. It was on most of the raptors have been logged twice. Most of the raptors have been logged at least once, if not twice. Um, this was probably logged once. The bigger trees, the huge chestnut oak tree. It's the entire ridge. It's, it's constant. So, um, this is a Tula Poplar, and here's two with the Big Tree Award. Um, that's Director Mike Roberts, my boss, and Chris Patty, my boss. 154 inches around. Um, and I'm going to show you how you can see this. Norm Mayweather, my buddy there, and Nathan, who does some of our videos. Nathan Cop, he's great. You're on there. You know about, you know about how old it is? I just did something. Well, the best way to know is court. We're not going to do that. So our urban our urban expert on trees is Dr. Lowe from Penn State. Um, he puts it around 175. He was left for a reason. It's on the north slope too, just like South Cove. If you like South Cove, you get those tree species there. You get yellowwood. You get buckeye. You get pawpaw. You get tulip poplars. So they get really big. It's a little bit more moisture on that slope. So if you want to see that, all you got to do is walk out here and make trail observation there, because we now own that entire piece of it. If you look off that deck in the distance, you're going to see this tree sticking out. The, <clears throat> that's the tree. Wow. Now, I'm not being negative here, lightning's going to hit that tree one day. It's the tallest thing in the ridge. It's just going to happen. We're going to enjoy it every minute until then, and even after. But uh, if you want to go on one of these hikes, we have them. Love to have you on. We have different levels of them. We have moderate to strenuous. Um, it takes us back to the past landscape. The Hall Farm has really been revitalized. It was a 1979 acquisition, one of the key acquisitions in that area, but they're all key to me. So I gotta note that. Every acre is important. This one is all watershed, drained right into Otter Creek, uh, right into the lagoon, is where everything drains from the Hall Farm. So our maintenance shop's here now, the white barn's still there now. It's a Dutch influence barn. We haven't found another one like it in the state of Tennessee. It's going to go on the historic registry in a few years with, with the entire farm. We're converting this farm back to native grasslands now. We planted 40 acres, $42,000 worth of seed of our own native grassland mix. You want to hike with me. Some of you others may have been. If not, you can go this spring or fall. Um, 2017, I saw two monarch butterflies the entire summer. I saw 21 an hour in the hall farm last summer. Wow. Never did roll up. <laughs> have one following me around. <laughs> so, we, this started with the research, though. Sam King and Will Peters, along with Dr. Lowe, funded by friends around the lake, we did a study of the hall farm itself. That was the Meiji, remember? That was the Meiji farm in the earlier slides. You had this subsistence scratching for a living farm in Appalachia going on. They farmed every inch of it they could. They cut every tree they could. That's how they made a living. Um, this is what you're seeing in that. Okay. Now it's all native plants. We got really excited. Monday I was hiking. Monday evening I was hiking. I was hiking over to them. We were hiking over there looking at a piece of property we had bought some years ago. So I'm walking through there, I had to step around all the native filters that come in. And they just keep me excited. I don't know what's coming. So that used to be all bull thistle, which is the native plant of Scotland. And it does a lot. So 
Uh, so research at Penn State, we talked about that plant. We're finding that in all of our drainages, except we don't have it in the hall. Anybody want to guess why? Anything farmed the last 50 years with compaction, the plant is going to that. It's tires. Compaction in the ground. Can't sustain it. Eight foot plant has a root system about that deep. Really shallow root. Remember, deer like it. It's got to have that perfect balance. So, one of the great things we had in place long before me was no hiking off trail. If you like seeing the eagles today, that's why we got it. If you like seeing plants like that, that's why we got it. So those before me, well before me, knew what they were doing. We had a good management plan, and now we're benefit from it. So, so the Hall Farm also has our aviary center. If you haven't been there, it's an eight hundred thousand dollar privately funded project thanks to Friends of Radnor Lake and the Bart J. Mack Foundation, and a lot of individual donors. Uh, this is Charlie Hank and Mr. Turner, and that's uh, Norm Meadum. They were really key in the beginning to help get that going. I scratched that out on a cocktail napkin with Anna in Mel Rose <laughs> um, in 2012, 2013. And it started with a $50,000 concept of what can we do to create an educational facility to take care of some birds of prey that can't be released in the wild, not releasable. And it turned into this how do we build a facility that's the best visitors with special needs facility in the state? That's what I think we got. Sure is steep getting up to it. It is. And we did that on purpose, Bill. <laughs> At the time, we were the 48th most out of shape state in the country. <laughs> we moved up two points to the Cousin of the Barber J. Mapp The 46th now. So, Bill's right. It is steep. But here's the thing we, uh, we'll talk a little bit about special needs. We give people assistance to get there every week. That's always an offer that's out there. We want everybody to be able to. So while it is a walk to destination, we do accommodate folks all the time. We're glad to do it. So this is Ranker Paul doing a phenomenal job with an injured red tail hawk. We got that bird in, before we built the aviary in 2014. It's a female, it's a really sweet bird. She's got a really bad wing injury. She couldn't be released back in the wild. So the goal with all those birds are they go to a rehab, they get healed, and they go back in the wild. That's everybody's goal. When that doesn't happen, two of the things happen. They get euthanized or they go to an education facility like ours. We didn't like option two, so we built option three. And if you gave to that, then. this is Al. She's uh, four years old. This bird hates my guts. Some of y'all can empathize, possibly. Um, she doesn't like me. She doesn't like my shaped head. She loves my aviary system at Kinsey. It's sickening. She can feed out of her hand. She purr, poos, and it's sickening. And it's awesome. <laughs> If you're a visitor experiencing that, you'll pick up on that immediately. The relationship with the handler of the bird. But a great bird, this bird lets me handle her, she just doesn't like it. But uh, same thing, bad wing. Owls are designed to fly, almost be silent and blind. Uh, when that, it's like a car getting out of alignment, you can't ever get it back in alignment though when it comes to birds of prey, whether bodies are designed. So this is Mackenzie with her owl. Uh, this is during COVID. So one of the one of the things, one of the blessings of COVID, high points out of all that negative and all that bad was we kind of had this point of clarity. I think we did, I hope we did. That let more was not always better. Less is more. So we went to small groups, 25. We're doing I got one this Saturday, 10 a.m. You can probably still sign up if you want to do it. We're doing groups of 25 or 30. And we loved it. Visitors loved it. The engagement was better. So on any Saturday, I'd have 150, 200 people come up to the aviary. Um, it was like a zoo. You get crazy. And it was great. But we like this better. And I think we, the feedback we got, that's hit the right chord. Now this is eagle number two. She's one of my girlfriends. We have a sickening relationship. <laughs> uh, she was shot in 2016 in East Tennessee. So she was a juvenile then. I've been working with her since about 2017. She's still got metal in her body, and we have to draw blood on her and test her body for leg standards twice a year. If you've never drawn blood on the eagle, don't. <laughs> 900 PSI, they are the ultimate killing machine, as they were designed. 
You can't tell that she's got a physical injury at all. She's mean as they come. She's dominating. She chases half my staff around when they go to take care of her. And I love her to death. Because she's exactly what American Bald Eagle should be. So, um, in captivity, they live lifespan up to 40 years. So when we take that bird on, it's a lifetime commitment. And the friends around like to do that with Barbara J. Matt Foundation. Big payback coming up in other ways. It costs about six dollars and fifty cents to feed an eagle every day. So we feed them trout from Bucks North, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I had to take, I had to make a profession. I had to take this on. This is a public service commitment I made. I had to grill one of those restaurant gray trout with lemon pepper. <laughs> and taste it to make sure it's safe for all the birds. It was delicious. <laughs> so, um, if you come to Andrew Center, that's just part of our internal operation. This is what we want. This is what we want. So, it's a golden eagle in the back. She's uh, 17 years old. Me and her got a sickening relationship, too. Um, you just have to see it to, to explain it. She's awesome. We got her from Catalina Island. Uh, Institute of Wildlife Studies there, they do phenomenal work on birds of prey and other research. They got a loggerhead strike and some dangerous species they're doing research on, just really neat stuff. Dr. Peter Sharp's over that, and he is awesome. And they're one of our partners. Um, but we got that bird, we interviewed before, we got her in December 2018. She kind of finished off our birds there for the eight year. Um, so moving ahead, what's the future look like? This is back to COVID. So we learned some things with COVID. This is Randy Damien setting up a spotting scope with an iPhone adapter. Now, as you look at our iPhone, we can step back. Bill and Dale can look at my iPhone and see what we're looking at. I can stay five or six feet away from them. They can take their own phone, take a picture of it or a video. It's like the ideal thing for COVID. <clears throat> we're still doing it as we're coming out of COVID. We love it. We think it's great. We can video on it. We can send people. I download photo, photos of people every day I'm doing scope for them. Just airdrop it to them. But this is what we're focusing on. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Jim Rison, if you know him, he's done a phenomenal job forming this. Uh, it's kind of like a tree with branches or an umbrella. It's called um, Access 23rd. We learned during COVID that about a million of 6.8 million Tennesseans, or 6.8 million Tennesseans, maybe a couple hundred thousand more to hang today yeah. at the rate he's going, but about 6.8 million Tennesseans. About a million of those have some kind of special need. It can be diabetes, on down, to where my, somebody like my parents that are dead. And out of those special needs, they really got redefined during COVID. Because now, folks that had diabetes, well, there was a, they were concerned about coming to public, to parks. They were, you know, all of us had those concerns to some degree or another. Um, our focus moving forward, and I always had but we're really emphasizing that now. Visitors with special needs is a primary focus on October 7th at this natural area. Moving forward, friends are at the lake behind it, the state's behind it. Rather than doing the minimum, the Barbara J. Mapp Aviary Education Center is where that really started. Rather than doing what's required by federal law, the ADA Act, <clears throat> what can we do? What's the maximum we can do? So, Instead of wheelchair accessible, we're calling it wheelchair friendly. Wheelchair accessible means you check the box. We don't want to check the box. We want the, the, we want the person, depending on the wheelchair, to have the same experience that we're having. So this is an iPhone adapter we're talking about with spotting scope. Um, other thing we did to get notice from the deck, we got a new scope. Um, this is uh, Commissioner Eze with tourism. This is what, uh, this is just a simulation. Um, this is what the lake looks to it like it's in the fall. If you're colorblind, that's what it looks like. So now they have these color viewfinders. Tourism gave us a grant for one. And we now have one on our observation deck. We have a big press thing on it. They brought out X amount of people. And about, I forgot, about 70% of them saw color. Yeah. To mm -hmm. some point. So it was a big day for us. It was a great day. That's the kind of stuff we want to do more of. Uh, Eagles, we talked about that to start. I'm going to wrap up with it. This is uh, Bob Hatcher, passed away years ago. He's the godfather of Eagles in Tennessee. He was 
smack dab in the middle of an eagle restoration effort with a lot of other great people in the 70s and 80s. Um, Bob helped us design the Aviary Center. and helped us with our partnership with the American Eagle Foundation, who were great. He was on their board as an advisor. He was a state wildlife coordinator for 30, 40 years. Um, and that's why we got this today. Because all those people 50 years ago, starting back with Rachel Carson. We've got a Rachel Carson day coming up, by the way. We've been doing that this our fourth year at the Aviary Center. And I love her. I wish I could. We make jokes with the federal government around what they're doing and being. <laughs> she did. She proved everybody wrong. And that's why we're seeing this now. Uh, I know we hear a lot of bad news about the environment. I know there's a lot of areas that we can work on. But this is the best shape for my 51 years on this planet. This is the closest legal nest ever documented to the capital of Tennessee. It's right up there. Four in Davidson County. That's the fourth one on January 22nd. So we worked with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They came out. I asked them to come out in November. We planned all of this. We've been planning for this for 20 years. Uh, Bill, we all planning for it back in the day? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course they were. Because <laughs> actually they were. Because they were buying land. Thank you. Thank you. You're buying land. Yeah. You're buying land. So I keep knocking it off. <laughs> but um, we haven't come out. We had a plan that we wanted to execute where we engaged the public on the Eagles, but we didn't mess it up. So, thank you. So, Eagles were delisted in 2007 from the threatened list um, in the 90s from endangered. But if you go back and read the manual on what we're using now, our resource management, the guidelines for American bald eagle protection, Guess how many feet? Anybody know how many feet it was from human interaction to a bald eagle nest when they were endangered or threatened? It's about 660 feet. It's 700. Okay. Guess how many feet the, the eagles are from the Otter Creek Road? 509 feet. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think they moved to the limit. They don't put this word on their species list. And it's on threatened. I think that status, they knew what they were talking about. And I wish I knew that back then, but they knew. The eagle's nest is 530 feet from the lake trail. You can't see it from the lake trail because they built it out of a point at an angle away. It's 590. It's a little bit more than that for the observation day. But this is the day that we announced it. That's uh, Roger McCoy, Director of National, uh, Mike Robertson, my great ranger staff, and we've got two juvenile eagles on the lake also. King Ranger is just like some. I love this bird. It's chasing wood ducks. <laughs> didn't catch any, didn't catch any for the record. But Ken let me use it. Ken got some great photos that day. Um, he was not really good at catching ducks here. I'll catch coots. That's about it. And we're learning, they're teaching me every day. I love it. I feel like, I feel like I missed man's class again back after learning in fourth grade. But this is what it's see. Any day you're out now, you'll probably see this at a certain point of the day. That's the area of the road right across from the nest. That's where we're going to set up our scopes most of the time. And these are the signs and things, and this is my staff. We were doing this in December. December, January. Um, at the last minute, I asked the Barbara J. Mack Foundation for a grant. My friends were out of the they raised $5,000 on uh, Giving Tuesday. We put up a security net system around that nest. If anybody walks off trail, six rangers get to their face on the plane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting one a week. Oh, yeah. Whenever we we got three last Saturday, last Sunday afternoon we got three. What do you do when you catch them? They go to court. Mm. Yeah. It's an expensive option. Yes. So, um, yeah. Every every answer you can imagine is what we got. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see a sign. <laughs> and I got it on video walking by the sign. <laughs> I've got one of our guys telling this guy, I would do that at the mountain side, and the guy goes down to the lake. Wow. Maybe you can erect an electric fence. Well, <laughs> you can't fix people sometimes. So, um, <laughs> but we got these up. We're, we're still going to continue to add to that. We don't want to turn the lake trail on the interstate, billboard either. Um, but the eagles are teaching us. And the interesting thing about that is the hall farm is really a critical component of this. Historically, the past land use was important. We got our first 
Thanksgiving Day, we had to shoot a deer on Granny White Park. Um, we got hit by a car down at Richard Country Club. We had to put it down. We knew that. Peter Bray asked us to help. We're close. We don't have to suffer. So we do that. We take it back to Off Farm. Cody's get to eat it, vultures, everything. So the guys are loading it up. And as they're taking it back, I said, How many times y'all shoot that? He said, No. I said, I asked Ranger and Jerry, I said, Dig the bullet down that and put a camera on it tonight. So he digs the bullet out, puts a camera on it in the Hall Farm. In a matter of hours, the ball, I got a bit picture of a bald eagle feeding on that deer. We got to a change and adapt and a management for this conservation option. We got, we got to lead by example. And we got to think smart. We got to look at things like underground power lines, electrocutions, high on the list of things to get your larger birds of prey because your wingspan, the eagle's six feet, a golden eagle's seven feet. So we got to think smarter, we got to work smarter, we got to plan better. Um, this is Miss Mann, my fourth grade teacher who brought me here. Oh, um, that's Dr. Hester, so they were both my teachers. But, um, I want to end this session with that and then open up for any questions. Y'all been great. Thank you for the time.